Blog Talk Radio. The funeral is about to begin, sir. The calling hours. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. They will say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for, if not for shedding? Welcome to another episode of the Calling Hours Horror Podcast on Horror Society Radio. I am your host, the dead man, Michael Jones, also one of the featured writers over at HorrorSociety.com. We're going to have a great, great episode this evening. I think I've lined up some interesting guests. Uh, tonight in our main interview, we're going to have Ryan Stacy, Christy Faulkner, and Stacy Frieders on to talk about Midsummer Nightmares 2. Uh, in our indie spotlight, we are going to have Danny Thompson on to talk about Rock Band vs. Vampires. We are also going to be reviewing Screen Factories Beneath, and we are also going to be reviewing Millennium Entertainment's Blu-ray release of Frankenstein Created Woman, and in our Metal Blade Spotlight this evening, we are going to have Flotsam and Jetsam, so it is certainly going to be a fascinating night, to say the least. So in about 13 minutes, Danny Thompson should be joining us to talk about Rock Band vs. Vampires, but to get the evening started, we are going to do our... Blu-ray review of the Hammer Collector's Edition of Frankenstein Created Woman, released through Exclusive and through Millennium Entertainment. And we want to give a special hello and thank you to our friend uh, Heather Wixon, who sent this out for us for review. To give you an idea of what the film is about, a tormented girl, uh, Susan Denberg, drowns herself after her lover is framed for her father's murder and guillotined. Baron Frankenstein, played by Peter Cushing, experimenting with the transfer of souls, places her lover's soul into her body, bringing Christina back to life. Despite having no memory of her past life, she is driven by revenge and carries out a violent retribution on those responsible for both deaths. And the first thing I need to say uh, about this release before anything else is it, this is an absolutely amazing release. I mean, the cover art is beautiful. You know, you, we've got Peter Cushing right here and Susan Denberg on the front cover. But not only that, in addition to all of the nice extras that are on this Blu-ray, we got something uh, that Anchor Bay used to do back in the day, and that is an inclusion of exclusive collectible cards that look like they were possibly lobby cards or promo cards uh, to help promote the film when it first came out. Uh, being the collector that I am, I have not had the nerve to open them yet. If I did, I would probably have to put them in the frames. I'm just, I'm just that crazy about my special features and things like that. Overall, I think it's an amazing transfer. Um, I think it ranks right up there along with a lot of the stuff that we see from Scream and Shout Factory, to say the least. Uh, just to give you an idea of who uh, was in the film, uh, with the cast and crew, we had, of course, Peter Cushing, uh, Susan Denberg, uh, Barry Warren, Peter Blythe, Robert Morris, Duncan Lamont, Derek Folds, Thorley Walters, Alan McNaughton, P. 
Peter Madden. Um, producer was uh, Anthony Nelson Keyes, and the director was Terrence Fisher. Um, and, and again, it, it it really is an incredible looking film. I mean, for those of us that are old enough to remember seeing it, the you know the few times it might have played on TV or on cable, um, you know, for a Hammer film, I mean, it looks absolutely stunning. You know, not uh, not as gory as some of the other Hammer films, but it's always nice to see Peter Cushing once again taking up the role of uh, Victor Frankenstein, considering how you know how many different roles he had in in all of all of the Hammer films. I mean, his not, his name is pretty much synonymous with with uh, Hammer and of course Baron Frankenstein. Now in this one as well, we we don't see so much of the you know, putting together of of the monster and all that. We definitely get, some, you know, some of the scientific things where Frankenstein comes up with a way to trap the soul behind an energy barrier so that it can't leave the body, you know, can't leave the body. And his experiment in the beginning where he freezes himself basically to death for an hour to prove the point is is pretty funny. Um, the sad part is, is uh, the tormented girl, you know, Susan that Susan Denberg plays, you know, is, is deformed and, and is in love with uh, with the young man who is guillotined, and she commits suicide out of her sadness. And uh, Frankenstein and, and his assistant uh, basically rebuild her body into a stunning blonde, and who eventually the other side of her personality takes over, and she murders those that that framed her lover for her father's death. So it's uh, definitely worth checking out. Um, as far as the special features go, or just the details in general, um, the running time is about an hour and a half. You know, it doesn't have a rating; it's an NR rating. Um, released on January the 18th of this year. <coughs> Excuse me. The film was originally produced in 1967. And it's one disc. Now, some of the special features include commentary with uh, Derek Folds, Robert Morris, Jonathan Rigby. We have the Frankenstein-created woman trailer on here. Now, this, some of the bonus features are really the the keystone, or, you know, the crown jewel of this set. In particular, we had three items. Uh, the World of Hammer episode, The Curse of Frankenstein, which runs uh, approximately 25 minutes, and goes over the history of the the Baron and Frankenstein's monster through Hammer horror films and covers several different uh, actors who played the role, in particular, of course, Peter Cushing. I mean, that goes without saying. But they include uh, some nice footage from each film and and, and kind of lay out the plot line of, of how Dr. Frankenstein, Baron Frankenstein, went through his progression in the Hammer films. There is a second World of Hammer episode on there, uh, Hammer Stars, with Peter Cushing. And again, this is an overview of all the characters and roles he's played in Hammer Studios' different films. And it, it, you know, it's just amazing when you sit and you think about you know everything that Cushing has done. I mean, if you look at what he just did with Hammer, not including anyone anywhere else in the world, it's almost amazing to think about you know what a true icon. He is in the industry as well. I think the real key piece to all of this is the brand new documentary. It runs about 45 minutes long called Hammer Glamour. And basically what this is is a spotlight piece on the many different women who have had roles and, you know, were the leading stars in a lot of Hammer's horror films. Several of the actresses included include uh, Valerie Leone, uh, Carolyn Monroe, Martine Beswick, Madeline Smith, Vera Day, Valerie Gaunt, Ursula Andrews, Raquel Welch, uh, Jenny Hanley, Ingrid Pitt, and Julie Edge. And, you know, this runs about 45 minutes, and it, and it really is a unique look into, you know, because a lot of these women were were the starting point for for women who had reoccurring roles in horror films, they're, they're definitely the cornerstone of, of a lot of the actresses today. I mean, you know, two names alone, Ingrid Pitt and Carolyn Monroe right there certainly speak volumes about the films. And, you know, Raquel Welch, you know, 
just about anyone involved on this list. But it's nice because they have several of the actresses current day sitting down on almost like a round table style. They have uh, individual interviews, and then there's uh, one where you have um, Valerie Leone, Cal- uh, Carolyn Monroe, uh, Martine Beswick, and Madeline Smith all all sitting on a couch, and it's almost kind of a, a round table discussion about their experiences with Hammer. You know, some of them talk about, and one of the things I found interesting, especially since this is still Women in Horror Month. Um, it, you know, like they spoke very highly of Ingrid Pitt and and her ferocity of of being proud of being a woman and her roles and her body and things like that. So I mean, that was that was definitely a very interesting aspect to look at. Then we had um, several of the actors and or, or the actresses talking about their experiences with nudity in the films, um, talking about how you know when they signed their contracts, it was one thing or another, and one of them. You know, spoke about how she wouldn't mind doing an undressing scene since it was in silhouette. But since it was in silhouette, she should be wearing two bras, you know, two shirts, two bras, another pair of pants since it's only in in silhouette. So I found that to be, you know, an extremely interesting look. And then, of course, they talked about the different actors and directors, um, you know, Peter Cushing and things like that. So, again, I feel like it was a, a highly informative behind the scenes i feel like you learn a little bit more about you know the who's who and and just the history in general of hammer horror films um this is the first time that the movie has been available in hd i do highly recommend it uh if you're a fan of hammer if you're a fan of peter cushing if you're just a fan of horror in general this is definitely it's definitely interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll never come out and say that I think Hammer was a ripoff or copying the Universal horror flicks. Not at all. I think they just shed a different light and a different perspective on the classic monsters. And I'm glad to see that the Hammer films are getting the Blu-ray treatment that they deserve. So a lot of things goes out to Millennium Entertainment and exclusive media for putting this out. And again, thank you to Heather Wixon for sending us a review copy of the film. But uh, coming up here in about two or three minutes, we should be hearing from our first guest in our indie spotlight this evening, Danny Thompson. She's going to come on to tell us about Rock Band versus Vampires. I am definitely looking forward to that. Uh, I got to watch the trailer a little bit earlier today. Uh, one of my other, one of the other writers over on Horror Society is doing a little bit more of a in-depth look into the film. But I can tell you from what I've seen, it definitely looks like it. It it has some some panache to it. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to get the director on this evening. He was occupied, but Danny was nice enough to stay up late in the UK to come on and talk about the project here in a minute and let us not forget that at 8 30 a little bit later on this evening we're going to be having ryan stacy christy faulkner and stacy frieders on to talk midsummer midsummer nightmares too um i've had christy on before she spoke about the project when i had um Jacqueline Martini on, Jacqueline Poole on as my guest host uh, a couple months ago. So we're definitely looking to hear more about the project and what is going on with it. And uh, like I said, to keep in mind with Danny, we're hoping everything goes well. She's calling in from the UK. They are several hours ahead of us. She will be calling in on Skype. So we will give her a minute or two to collect herself and give us a call. But to let people know a little bit more about the film, which and we will certainly be asking Danny about it when she calls in, what we've got here is um, the film is co-directed by Malcolm Galloway. Um, it is an independent comedy horror feature film set in London. Um, it has just finished Principal Photography. It tells the story of Jeremiah Winterford, an old-fashioned vampire who finds himself awkwardly out of place in the modern world. Forced to move to Winterford Manor following a torching by his vampiric rival, Jaco Zanziel, 
Winifred and his surviving acolytes must find themselves making a new home in Camden, which is the heart of rock music in London. Where better for vampires to hide in plain sight? Uh, Sorcerer's Tower is an unsuccessful prog rock band, and they are booked to play at the reopening night of Angelfish, a Camden music venue now under new vampiric ownership. Armed with their instruments, can the band save the small, their small number of fans from an eternity, eternity of vampirism? Um, the film, of course, is, is directed by Malcolm Galloway and uh, co-directed by uh, Raid Abbas. Raid uh, also leads the post-production editing uh, visual effects process. And... Um, Is produced by Clockwork Heart Productions Limited, Abbas Films, and Games Limited, and Lauren Petta. Um, according to Malcolm, uh, the film is largely based on an, uh, is largely an autobiographical film, apart from the bits about vampires and orgies, based on his experiences of playing in a small local band in real life. Um, the name of the band was Hats Off, Gentlemen. It's adequate, apart from the bits about the vampires as well. So they do have um they do have the trailer up over at moviepilot.com. Um I definitely recommend checking it out. Um definitely indie horror. Um and and it looks like it's entertaining. In fact, when I spoke to Malcolm earlier, one of the things I told him is uh listening to the trailer and I meant this of course in absolutely the best way. The gentleman who uh was on there doing the voiceover it just so reminded me of a trauma trailer. And I know there are some of you out there that love trauma, hate trauma, but I really felt like it it applied well to the trailer. Uh, They have a nice, uh, talented cast and crew. Cast includes Guy Barnes, Lauren Petta, Jake Rundle, Malcolm Galloway, Faye Sowell, Danny Thompson. I keep getting pop-ups. Richard Herring, Casey uh, Fisk. Fistosis, uh, Dita Tang Tang, Adam Dindorf, Vaxal Germain, and Giles uh, Banrath. There is a trailer up on YouTube as well, um, and a little audio teaser on SoundCloud. So I would definitely tell you to go out there and check it out. They are on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. So definitely go and check this out. I, I definitely feel like this is something that will that will work out well. So, I don't know. Um, it, 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 it definitely looks like a project to be worth checking out. Of course, you know, reading it, it's, um, it's a British film, a UK film. So, I think that will really lend a lot of difference. I don't remember seeing a lot of, you know, of course, other than the old Hammer stuff we were talking about. Um, y- you know, I, I think... Uh, I think it's something that should be checked out. Um, I, I just think it would be a, a different aspect. And I just heard from Danny. She's having trouble. She don't think she's going to be able to make it in. So what I will do is I will highly recommend – she's going to try on her computer here in a second, so we shall see if she is able to join us. But um, I think with everything that's going on with this film, I think there's a lot of – potential. In fact, they uh wow. So yes, um I would definitely make sure to head over to their Twitter, uh their Facebook, their Tumblr and support this film in any way that you can. Their their Facebook page is highly entertaining and I am looking forward to seeing the film and sadly if if Danny cannot make it in on uh Skype this evening. I will certainly try to get Malcolm and Danny on the show as a full guest as for the hour long interview. I would like I said I would certainly like to get their their view on the film taking and the process that went on with making the film. So, since it looks like they may not be able to make it on, I am going to go ahead and move to our first Metal Blade Spotlight for the evening. 
tonight uh, in the Metal Blade Spotlight, we are going to have Flotsam and Jetsam off of the album No Place for Disgrace, which is a remaster for this year. And the first song we're going to play is Dreams of Death.
Kevin Jetsam off their newest release, No Place for Disgrace 2014, which is actually a remaster replaying the name of the song was Dreams of Death. Unfortunately, due to technical circumstances, Danny will not be able to join us this evening, but I am going to reschedule with her and Malcolm and get them both on the show at a later date because I do think Rock Band vs. Vampires is something that will be interesting and that many in our audience will look forward to seeing. Uh, any minute now, we should be hearing from our feature interviewed guest for the evening. From Concept Media, we're going to have Ryan Stacy, Christy Faulkner, and Stacy Frieders on to talk about Midsummer Nightmare 2 in our indie spotlight. Like I said, some of you may remember I have had Christy on in the past. I believe she was on, I want to say it was episode 2. So I am looking forward to that. And in fact, it looks like we have one now. This is the Dead Man on Horse Society Radio. Who do we have joining us? It's us. It's all of hey, us. Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Is everybody on all on the same line? Yeah, I call three-way. Oh, oh, well, very nice. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> let's say hello to Ryan Stacy, Christy hello. Faulkner, and Stacy Breeders. Hey, guys. Well, hello. long time no talk, in particular uh, to, to Ryan and Christy there. How, how has everyone been? Doing awesome, actually. Thank you. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad I was able to schedule you guys to come back on. Oh, I'm glad um, to be here. First things first. Let's, uh, Ryan, since you're the, the head honch, one of the head honchos over there at uh, Concept Media, uh, mm-hmm. refresh everyone on how Concept Media came to be and how um, this, the film series came to be. Well, um Concept Media was started actually in, I believe, January of 2011, and we formed when we decided to make the film I had written called Midsummer Nightmares. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, Stacy, who is a longtime best friend of mine, she was in the cast very early on. I think as I was writing it, she was. And, and Stacy, how many roles did you have in that? <laughs> Um, I believe I had three or four. <laughs> <laughs> but you ended up playing Danielle. I did, I did. Mm-hmm. So that's where it all started, and now three years later we've all come back. and Well, most of us came back, and we did the summer, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, Stacey, you, you were involved with the first one as as well as you were, Christy. Kind of tell us about how you became involved with the first one and how it all led to the second one. And you guys can go in it, you know, you two can go in any order. <laughs> go ahead, Stacy. <laughs> all right. Um, well, as Brian said, <laughs> when I started out with Mr. Nightmares, I started out with three or four different roles. Um, I was in the lineup to play um, a character that he named Michelle. We weren't sure what we were going to do with her, but in the end that was, played by our, our, uh, our friend Amanda. And then uh, I got cast as Liz, who we all know is the gothic bitchy girl. And then uh, after that, Brian lost the original girl that he had playing Danielle. And uh, he called me up and he's like, how would you like to be a killer? <laughs> I said, man, I would That's love always nothing how it more. <laughs> Christy, with you, uh, tell 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 remind everyone again about how you became involved with the series and how you felt about it when they announced the sequel. Um, actually, Ryan had found me on Model Mayhem. He wasn't sure about um, the original girl, uh, Julie Sherwood, playing Audrey, and um, was actually trying to find an understudy for her to be to be safe and. He contacted me on Model Mayhem and gave me an opportunity, even though I had never acted in anything before. But, um, I mean, obviously he was looking for a redhead because um, in the first one, um, Julie had uh, red hair to play Audrey. So um, when he had first contacted me, you know, he had told me he didn't know if I was going to um, actually have the role because, like I said, he wasn't sure about Julie 
Um, but unfortunately, she did um, have other obligations, and I was then casted as Audrey Small in Midsummer Nightmares 2, and um, I was, I honestly don't know how I did it, <laughs> because <laughs> I had to learn everything within, like, two weeks before my first day on set, whereas the rest of the cast had much, much longer to learn all their things, all their lines or whatnot. So it was pretty stressful, and when he had offered it to me, I was thinking, oh, yeah, absolutely, I would love this. And then I'd get off the phone like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I have no idea if I'm going to be able to do this. <laughs> but, of course, I couldn't tell him that at the time. You know, but uh, it ended up working out in the end, I suppose. So it's a good time. Now, now, Ryan, for you, you know, yeah. with the – you know, kind of kind of tell everyone about the success that the first film had, and at about what point did you guys decide that you wanted to do a sequel? I started writing the sequel, like, probably the weekend it premiered at the theater in October of 2011. I remember starting toying with the idea of a sequel then, because we left the ending so open. I mean, Danny wakes up at the end of the first one after having her head bashed in with a trophy, and I'm like, right. I have to I have to continue this. But I wanted to make sure that when I did continue it and do the sequel, I did it justice. And it took me two years. So Right. I'm very proud now, of how what it did turned you, out turned out. What what did you find to be did you find it easier or harder to write a sequel for the film? And you know, what did you try to add for the second one that you didn't have for the first one? You know, did you did you guys try to go after bigger locations, things like that? You know, kind of kind of tell oh, me yeah, about did that get a big process. Location. We got a huge location actually, courtesy oh, of some friends, longtime friends of Stacy's family actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stacy, tell them about that house because you were there when that house was being constructed. Oh my God, this house is gorgeous. Ryan and I were talking for years in our youth about how we would just love to film a horror movie here. Because it's secluded out, it's out in the middle of the woods. It's mm-hmm. this beautiful three-story home that is just it's massive and gorgeous. And we mm-hmm. finally got to film there, which was pretty awesome. <laughs> that was courtesy of Larry and Hazel Newsom. They're awesome. <clears throat> the house, like, let me tell you about this living room. This of this house, Please. it has vaulted ceilings that are like thirty feet tall. Oh wow! It's it's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. It seriously is. You'll see it in the film. It's it's a really awesome house. And they were very kind and let us out there. We ran over on shoots, and they let us come back for more days after we were supposed to have wrapped. I mean, they were amazing. Mm-hmm. They were very accommodating. It was very mm-hmm. awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you usually don't get a lot of that in, in the indie film part. A lot of times, if you don't mm-hmm. nail it, you don't. they don't let you come back. <laughs> but right. I'm glad to hear that you guys got that at least. Now, on this end, you you wear several hats, Ryan. I mean, writer, <laughs> producer, director, actor, casting director, special effects. You know, how do you manage to juggle all of those roles while while trying to make a film? And out of all of them, which do you find to be the most challenging? Well, you know, the most challenging, I think, is definitely being a director. That's the hardest part because you have, you know, total say over an entire – I mean, we had a huge crew, and that was the first time we had something that big. And the way I'm able to juggle all these roles is I have awesome production assistants. I have some amazing ADs um, who also, in turn, do multiple jobs on set. So that's it makes it easier, but directing is definitely by far the most challenging part of filmmaking. Now, Stacy, for you, I mean, you wear several hats as well. You've been, you know, you actress, producer, effects artist. Again, for, you know, same question to you. You know, how how do you feel about juggling that many roles? And, and out of all of them, which do you find to be the most challenging? Honestly, I would have to say it was the special effects, um, especially in the first film because we had a lower budget. I had to construct everything on site as we did it, and we again, had time constraints, and then we obviously couldn't get, you know, fake blood here or there, and we had to confine it to this area, and it, honestly, that was 
probably the most difficult part was the special effects, just trying to get it to look realistic and nice on time. So we could just shoot, wrap it, because a lot of our shoots would end about, you know, 3 in the morning, and we'd been filming all day. Right. Now, Christy, for you, you know, you had mentioned um, how you had had to come in at the last minute, and you didn't have you didn't have quite the prep work uh, the first time. You know, how do you feel about coming in? You know, doing the film. You know, how do you, how do you feel like other work that you've done has prepared you know prepared you for what you did in this one? The only thing that, like I said, that this was my first acting gig at all that I've ever had. Um, what Ryan no, saw, I have no idea. No, it wasn't. Well, ladies' night, you... ladies' night, ladies' yeah. night. Yeah, I did have ladies' <laughs> night. I take that back. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I did have ladies' night, but I, but ladies' night, like you said, wasn't. I think um, there wasn't a lot of people on set. It was just kind of like um, in uh, the house we were using. It still was a completely different experience than with Midsummer. And I had a lot more time to get prepared for my role with Ladies' Night. Um, but with Midsummer, like I've said all along, with me coming in, being the new, you know, um, taking over Julie's shoes, that was big for me because I saw the first one, and I was a fan right off the bat. I loved it. I thought it was super cool. And to even have been I, – I, I just wanted to drive out there even if I – didn't get the role, and Julie had ended up playing Audrey um, just to go out there and meet everybody and to be on set. But um, once I did get the role and realized the shoes I was filling, I felt like Little Nemo in a, a ocean full of sharks that they're all going to come after me because I I just I didn't have experience on a set like that. Um, so it was, and I was nervous, and I was afraid I didn't know my stuff as well as everybody else, but. Um, everybody was so sweet and nice and helped me along and taught me a lot of stuff. Stacy taught me, um, well, she she beat me up a lot on, like, uh, the first day I was set with her. So, uh, <laughs> I, did. <laughs> like, I, I did. I did. I, I kind of beat her ass. Oh, man, we beat the crap out of each other. But yeah. um, <laughs> just learning a lot. I mean, everybody was so helpful. I mean, I would do it again in a heartbeat with with all those people. So it was an awesome experience, and I can't wait to see it. So, you know what? I'm sorry to interrupt you, Christy, but what you just said made me think of a scene that was originally written in Midsummer Two, that ended mm-hmm. up um, unfortunately getting cut out of my final draft of the script. But there was another moment where um, Audrey and Danny crossed paths. You know, before the big shit show at the end mm-hmm. and it was <laughs> yeah it was really cool like it you guys saw each other and she sort of mm-hmm. chased you and mm-hmm. you're supposed to do this like dukes of hazard style um <laughs> slide across the hood and just, oh yeah, oh, yeah i'd yeah, yeah. pay good money to see that <laughs> yeah. we should have put that, that in that man i mean happening. i know i know part three oh, well. i'm sure there'll be some good takeouts on that one Maybe um part three. I'll save that for like Midsummer three, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what's funny now, is I joke about that and Sean uh-huh. always tells me, he goes, No. Shut up. You're not doing that. I'm not I no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> because uh, my now, best thing comes in three, so seriously. That's true. Star okay. Wars, Lord of the Rings, come on. If okay. I did it I would have to get you know, a budget so I could do Midsummer Nightmares 3D. <laughs> 3D. Oh, yes. Ooh. <laughs> I already, as, as, an, as, as an effects artist as well, you've already intrigued me, so. <laughs> Part 3 and 3D. Yes, sir. Well, now, now let me I mean, ask you this. With it, with it being a lower, you know, it, it's it's. I don't want to. I don't want to say low budget or micro budget, but it's definitely not a Hollywood mm-hmm. budgeted film. No, not um, at all. From all three of you, what did you what did you find to be the most challenging aspect when it came to that? You know, did you guys ever run into situations where it was like, man, if we had a little bit more money, we could do this, or or did it lead to a lot of good improvis uh, improvisational aspects to the film? Well, I could think of Scotty at yeah. the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, was, was going to say both, honestly. A little bit of both. I mean, 
the, the I mean, I know we came across things in the first one and in the second one where if we would have just had a little more money or a little mm-hmm. more time, we could have pulled mm-hmm. some things off. And I know Ryan and I were talking a lot about that. But, you know, on the other hand, we managed to pull things off. We did manage to improv some things. And we, you know, like like what you guys said with Scotty's whole situation, mm-hmm. and we, were used, we had an issue with bad, bad liquid latex. <laughs> well, you know, I would like to comment on that and just say that, thankfully, um, Dustin Mills really helped clean up those effect shots for us where we just needed that little oomph to polish it off. So right. If Dustin's listening, Dustin's good people. Again for, I have not had yeah, him on the show is. yet. but So, Dustin, if you're listening, mm-hmm. your, your time's coming on the slab, man. You're going to be on the show sooner right. or later. <laughs> but, yeah, um, he better come on. <laughs> We'll, we'll get them on here sooner or later. Yeah. Now let's talk about that because I, you know I'd seen the first film obviously, mm-hmm. and I loved um, a lot of the effects work that you guys did. And you mentioned Dustin along with that. You know, did you mm-hmm. guys try to up the ante for the second film? I mean, are we going to oh, see yeah. more blood, more gore? Did you you know try to go more over the top? Uh, what are we looking at from that aspect? Um, I wanted to go a little more, but, you know, I wanted to try and keep it Mm semi-realistic. You know, I get, I think that people kind of get a little peeved with me sometimes because I'm not a huge gore hound. Um, I don't know. I just don't feel like that's appropriate in Midsummer Nightmares. It just doesn't fit my idea and the vision of what those films are, to me at least. Sure. Well, no, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, certainly Midsummer Nightmare was not a film where it was gore for gore's sake. There was there was actually right. a story there behind what was going on. So, I mean, oh, yeah. in a lot of ways, it's it's refreshing to hear you say that, that, you know, I didn't just throw blood to throw blood. I mean, that shows that there was some mm-hmm. thought going into the project. Mm-hmm. Now, when you revisited the second film um, as as actresses, ladies, you know, of course, Christy coming into t- this one as a replacement and, and, and Stacy coming back. You know, what did you try to do or bring to the roles that was an extension from the first film? Christy, you go first. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, um, and, I mean, in particular, especially Christy, since she didn't play the character in the first movie but took over the role right. in the second. Well, from watching the first one, um, Audrey was, um, you know, this more vibrant, fun, you know, she's getting excited for this Halloween party in the summer. And um, whereas after everything kind of happens, she's more secluded in a way. She um, is more angry, but she's preparing herself in a way she knew that shit was going to hit the fan again. And she was, she was ready for it. Um, mm-hmm. the way I prepared for it is <clears throat> by taking me having cystic fibrosis and looking at Danny as, as, as like, like an infection. <laughs> it sounds weird, but like as an infection <laughs> or as like something that's coming to get me, like, like with, with my CF, I could be good one day, terrible the next, and then end up in the hospital. That's kind of how I took this role, like, in my life, with my perspective, it, I'm, I'm trying to fight this off, and I know it's going to come back, and I'm going to keep fighting it. I know, I know it's going to come back, and it's not going to get me. It's not going to kill me. I'm going to overcome it. So that was the way I handled uh, the preparation with Audrey, um, e- w- even not being in the first one. So I just think Audrey was, in a way, just kind of a different um, – character in the second one. Sure. That's how I do it. How about for you, Stacey? Oh, for me. <laughs> um, with Danny, I, I liked her a lot this time around. It was her complete raw form, just like in the end of the first one, but it was that throughout the whole film. Like, it was just raw, pure Danny Smith. Mm-hmm. And right. I mean, it was – Christy was fantastic. She she just gave me so much to feed off of when 
when we were just in the finale, I mean, she just, she could hand it right back, and it just intensified everything. It was phenomenal. Um, and it's just, I, I love the way everything turned out with Danny, because I, I like the fact that I can draw off some of my hardships in the past, as Ryan knows. Um, I had some issues with theater. I never really fought for the parts that I wanted. You know, I'd go in and then just get discouraged and leave, or what have you, and I drew a lot from that. Um, and then what else I drew, I mean, I, it's just anger. It took everything I was angry at and just dumped it into the character, and it was fantastic. And then with Christie's raw emotions, it was, it just, it was wonderful. I loved it. <laughs> now, That's Ryan, from, my <laughs> <laughs> now from your end, you know, you switch one of your lead actresses. Um, you know, you have Stacy coming back. What were yeah. you, you know, what were your thoughts going into writing the sequel? You know, how much did you want the characters to evolve? You know, what did you what did you try to bring in that that made them different? That that furthered the story. You know, I just wanted them to be a little more grown up. I didn't want all these characters to be, you know, the atypical horror film characters where everybody's just all traumatized and it's just kind of melodramatic. So I just wanted them to be real. Like I just kind of wanted all of these families to feel this like shatteredness, I guess. <laughs> it, uh, it, what really helped was bringing Kelsey back from the first one because she played Liz and then now she's back as the, the twin sister, Cadence. And right. She brought such a sweetness to the film, and we really needed that. Don't you guys agree? Mm-hmm. Like, Kelsey's oh, yeah. character is really sweet, and she's smart, and she's very kind. That character is actually a lot like how Kelsey is mm-hmm. in person. Yeah, I love Kelsey. <laughs> and she's an awesome actress. She's hardworking, yes, and I love yeah. her. And I enjoyed that she also stepped in as a producer on this film as well. So... Kelsey very was actually nice. very instrumental in helping us um, acquire our camera that we use because we shot with – I forget what the camera is. You know, I'm not really <laughs> the technical one. That's Sean. Um, right. But it was a very nice Sony, wasn't it, guys? And yeah, Christy actually good. shot did, – did a shot for Sean in the film <laughs> that made it into the final cut. Yes. Yes. I felt very important when I seen that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Now let me let me ask you guys about this, and it's you know, granted this is Horse Society Radio. I'm not trying to toot yeah. horn, but we will a little bit. You were nominated. You guys were nominated for four different categories in the 2014 Horse Society Awards. Uh, mm-hmm. One for Best Short Ladies Night. Uh, yes. Christy was nominated for Favorite Screen Screen Queen. Uh, mm-hmm. Scott Gillespie was nominated for Screen Queen Screen King. Yeah, and Midsummer Nightmare <laughs> Two. What's that? I said, yeah, Scotty's a scream queen. <laughs> <laughs> and Midsummer Nightmares Two <laughs> is on the list of the most anticipated films of 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you know? Did that catch you guys by surprise? I mean, it's you know, yeah, I write for Horse Society. We're on Horse Society Radio, but I mean, you know. Mm-hmm. Have you gotten as much critical response from other websites and, and, and places? And, you know, how did it feel? To, I mean, how does it feel to be nominated four times? Of course, you know, to those listening, the winners have not been announced yet. So I don't even know who the winners no. are yet. But, how you know, how did it feel to be nominated, you know, Concept Media to be nominated for four different things and, you know, Christy for Scream Queen and things like that? You go first, awesome. Christy. Awesome, just because I'm so new to all of this, uh, I wasn't expecting any of it. So I'm in shock, and um, I know me and Ryan were like two little school girls on the phone, like, oh, my God, we're nominated. (laughs) So (laughs) we couldn't believe it. And I know we blow up our social media with it, but it's like, I mean, we're we're all so excited and excited. getting the votes out there and trying to let everybody know about it. So I think it's really cool. Now you're on you know, your end, Ryan. Oh, I was blown away. I was sitting here with Sean, actually, when 
I was sitting here at Sean's house. I'm here now at Sean's. And I was sitting there with him, and we looked, and both of our jaws just dropped to the floor. We were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, I'm very happy with it, and we have a very supportive fan base. It's small, but they love us. Mm-hmm. So, right. <laughs> pardon me. I just think That's that okay. uh, it's just – it's so cool to be nominated. I know people say that all the time. I don't, I don't know, sometimes they sound pretentious with it, but I really, I really do think it's just cool to be nominated. So mm-hmm. thanks. Well, for no, I, I, I feel that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's, you know, like I said, I mean, I do feel like it's well-deserved. I mean, everything that I've seen from concept media to this point has been very intriguing and, I, and I'm definitely looking forward to more. Mm-hmm. Now, well, thank you. What is, what is the word on release of the first film? Are are we going to see DVD release? Is it still playing in festivals? What's what's going on with the first film right now? Um, the first one's just kind of there, and people people get it. It's one of our big sellers. We sell a lot of them at the convention. So the conventions we go to, I mean. So I mean, we want to. Um, Shauna has talked about trying to re-release it in a Blu-ray format. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm definitely intrigued by that idea. I would also like to release the first and second one together, perhaps. You know, so I mean, I think that's actually kinda... a, a, an interesting concept to sell the set. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's now, cool. I mean, right now with Midsummer Two coming out, it's all Blu-ray DVD combo packs. Right. Yeah. Well, speaking of the second one, you guys mm-hmm. are going to have your uh, your premiere. March 1st mm-hmm. at the Englewood Cinema. Kind of tell yeah. everyone about how that came to pass and what kind of activities are you planning for the event? Is there going to be like a um, meet and greet? Is there going to be a and a photo opportunities, things like that? Well, you know, um, it's just going to be – our premieres are usually qu- pretty quiet events. Um, sometimes we do raffles where we'll give stuff away. At the end of the film, you know, little swag bags mm-hmm. for people. But um, so far, right now, all we have planned is just, you know, Ladies' Night is playing first. I would like to show that in the theater, and then uh, mm-hmm. we'll play Midsummer Nightmares too. I'm sure, you know, I could do a Q and A. Do you be down, Christy? Yeah, absolutely. That's a I good know, idea. I know Thanks, fans. Michael. I know fans eat that. Well, that's why I was asking, you know, because I'm getting it'll tie into the next question. But I know how much mm-hmm. fans like to meet, you know, the people that are in the films, you know, to ask questions. And and those are always good things that you can add on to the DVD when you release it. Mm-hmm. You know, pe- yeah. you know, person stands up at the at the, at the premiere and, and they know that you're filming them, you know, he's going to buy it. His buddies are going to buy it. They're all going to sit around and talk mm-hmm. about it. Now, right. of course, that's that's going to be the premiere. Are you guys looking at sending it to film festivals and possibly going around to film festivals to promote the film. Uh, we're definitely looking into film festivals. Um, we had, I think we've submitted to a couple conventions that are coming up because, you know, they have their little film festivals there. So we're definitely interested in pursuing that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry. But, yeah, um, I think we were looking at uh, Fright Night. <laughs> That's in Louisville. Have you ever heard of this convention? Louisville, Kentucky, yeah. Yeah. I think we were looking at trying to get it to play there. So. Well, yeah. And the only reason I bring that up is um, I'm starting to find more and more um, two good examples that I can give you guys. Um, mm-hmm. Matt Farnsworth, the, uh, the Orphan Killer, and mm-hmm. uh, Ma- Main Entertainment's Compound Fracture were both films yes. um, that I saw, very excellent films, and what they basically did is they took the film around the country, um, in Matt's case, uh, around the world, and self-distributed the film. Are you looking at wow. that as more of – as producers, both you and uh, Stacy, um, is that more along the lines of what you guys are looking to do is, is do it that way through download and through promotion? Or you know, are you hoping that a studio picks it up for a release? That's such a big question. I mean, <laughs> I would say I would love that stuff to be at anywhere, everywhere. I love exposure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <That's> enthusiastic. 
<laughs> I mean, so far we've just released everything ourselves, and you know we have looked into trying to get other forms of distribution, but um, I, you know we're just it's a quiet little plan with it. I mean, we're just seeing where it goes with it because the film is kind of I felt in ways um, kind of risky to make because so many people pay in sequels. Mm-hmm. So. I'm just I'm just letting it go and seeing what happens, really. <laughs> well, no, I mean I, I find that's kind of I, I find that comment interesting. Would Would you care to expand on it? I mean, I'm on on the risky aspect. Well, just because, unfortunately, when some sequels get made, they tend to flop, mm-hmm. and it will. Reading the script, it was kind of like a big venture, truthfully, a big leap for Sean and I in filmmaking. So. That's just what I mean when I say it was risky, because if it didn't, you know, come out all right, you know, we were going to fall hard on our asses. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've worked on indie films That's, too, man. I, trust me, I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, when Stacey you're the director. And Christy, go ahead. I just was going to say, especially when you're the director, because when a film fails, you know, the director's the one that gets lynched. Right, but when it does well, he's not the one anyone thinks of. Yeah, I, I know how that goes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Stacey and Christy, let me ask you this. Um, you know, with it being a sequel, you know, with Stacey, was, you know, was acting always what you wanted to do? And how did you feel about the transition to a sequel? And Christy, you did Ladies' Night, but, you know, Midsummer 2 is, you know, a full, you know, the full length, your first, you know, real leading role. You know, did you mm-hmm. have any reservations about them being about it being a sequel? You go first, honey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, no, because after seeing the first one, like Ryan said, I mean, you you see what happens at the end. You're kind of like, mm, yeah, there's probably going to be a second one. Um, but like Ryan has said to me from the beginning, he's like, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? And I'm like, yeah, okay, I trust you, I trust you. So he's, I've put all my faith in him, and he hasn't been wrong yet. So I, I was ready for it. <laughs> How about you, Stacey? Um, as far as the first question regarding if acting was something a voice wanted to do, um, I wanted to be an astronaut first, and then I wanted to be an actress. Well, I mean, hey. So, <laughs> I realize Man, that I don't like math. nothing wrong with that. So. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'm really good at acting. I get paid for lying. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Got to love it. No, I I really, yeah, I've always wanted to act. Um, It has been my dream career. I I just love doing it. I mean, it's the same reason why Halloween is my favorite holiday. It's just because you get to be anybody you want. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's crazy. And I love the imagination that goes into it and the creativity. And it just, honestly, it makes me so happy to do it. I just absolutely so pleased to do it. Um, as far as going into the second film, I was actually very excited to be doing the second film because this time it's it's not I have to play, you know, a soft little Christian girl and then, you know, just bust out the, the freaking crazy. It's like I am like balls to the wall, not so bitch, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I like that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you're, you're just flat. <laughs> you're flat out honest about it, and you know, I, I like that. You know, it seems like you relish the role, you want to jump into it, and you, and you give it everything that you got. So, I mean, I can definitely appreciate that aspect of it. But, um, Ryan, I had a couple. I had a question about some other films that uh, are listed on the Concept Medium Films page. So, I want to see if you can give us some information. And if okay. the young ladies that are with us are involved, I would certainly like them to speak up on these as well. Mm-hmm. The first film, and I just love the poster, it, it just says it all. Keep calm 
and Don't Fuck in the Woods. Oh, my God. What can you tell me about that film? And is, is everyone on here involved with this project? I, I just got to know about this. Um. Uh, no, I, I am not. I support Sean and everything he does, but I am I am not involved in the film. Okay. I am not either. As a producer or anything? No, I. No. Oh, I'm poor. <laughs> <laughs> I take all my money in Midsummer Nightmares too. They gotta wait for my wallet again. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you can tell us about? Uh, is there anything you can tell us about the film, uh, Ryan? <laughs> um, I truthfully don't know too much about it. Um, I know mm-hmm. that that title is very brazen. I have to say that the title kind of makes me blush when I hear it. <laughs> 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 and if anybody knows me, I'm a very like kind of bold person in some of the things right. I say and can tolerate. It, but I don't know that. Don't fuck in the woods. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's straight up to the point, man. <laughs> it's, it, it is. It says it. You do. It's you do this. Is. We know what's going to happen to you. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I don't okay. That I think it's cool because I think Sean is going with a creature feature type style movie. <laughs> Nice. So, yeah, uh, I'm very interested to see what he does with it. Okay. But the next yeah. film, and I really mm-hmm. like the poster on this one too, is uh, Stag. Yes. Uh, I any info on that one? About Stag in a minute. I haven't really heard about it much because I think Sean is now actively pursuing um, "Don't Fornicate in the Forest." <laughs> and um, <laughs> you're allowed to swear on my show. It's okay. I know, but I don't want to blush again. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) And then this, the the last one I'm going to ask you about, and again, the poster is calling my name, uh, Elphis. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That was uh, Sean and Scotty's uh, (laughs) improv movie shoot that happened right around Christmas time. I think it was oh, okay. maybe the day before Christmas Eve. I was in that film actually. <laughs> I played. Yeah, some, you were. Well, yeah, I played. Well, tell us. D-bag. Well, tell us about it now. Come on, this is your chance to promote your work, it's, all of you. I know it's about this. You know, there's a little elf on the show. <laughs> well, this one um, witnesses somebody being naughty, and so he kills her. Kind of like his in Ryan the Shore. <laughs> and I played this guy on her. FaceTime that was going to come over. It was a booty call. He was a total uh-huh. beast bag. Yeah. <laughs> but I really thought it was funny. And it was cool to see um, Scotty and Sean work on something together. Right. So, yeah, I really liked that one. And everybody seemed to really enjoy it. I think that was the uh, Christmas gift from Concept Media. <laughs> it was hey, fun. You know, I'm for it. I, I, I found that enjoyable. There needs to be more holiday themed horror, you know. I mean, I am so down mm-hmm. with this, especially, you know, we need a good Christmas one, we need a good Easter one. Um I'm trying to think of some other holidays that we're missing. I mean, concept I mean, please feel concept media can take any of these and make movies out of them if they want. <laughs> they have my permission. Take Patty's day. <laughs> well, Dustin Say, did do um an Easter movie, Easter casket. Yeah, he did Easter casket mm-hmm. and then yeah, I have Black not seen Christmas. that yet. I forget who does that. <laughs> I mean, the closest uh, thing I could ever remember with, with Easter was uh, <clears throat> the guy in Critters 3 who was in the buddy suit that got eaten from the inside out in church. I mean, that was the closest oh I ever got to an Easter movie. I mean, that was that yeah. was good stuff. But I'm dating myself by saying I watched Critters 3 when it came out, too, but we're not going to go there. Didn't that have Leonardo DiCaprio in it? Yes, uh, that it was, did. Critters, was that 3 or 4? One I of them. Anyway. But yes, Leo was in that. How sad. Uh, well, let me ask you guys this: what's um, what's coming up for Concept Media that that you guys you know have coming up? You know, any more feature films? Are you just gonna sit for a minute and just go out and promote Midsummer Two? W- what's in the wings here? Chrissy, do you want to tell him? You want me to? Yeah, I'm gonna have all of really? you answer the question. Yeah, somebody sure. better tell him. Uh oh. 
Go ahead. Well, it is. We are actually going forward with Ladies Night the movie. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, um, without giving too much away, what can you guys tell us about Ladies Night the movie? Go for it, Ryan. Um. Well, I will say that um, when we did Ladies Night, and then we did, we ended up shooting in Ladies Night two. Mm-hmm. So there's actually an existing short film that has yet to be assembled because mm-hmm. we were so busy with Midsummer two. I just put that kind of on the <laughs> shelf and was saving it for a rainy day. And someone mm-hmm. kind of advised me to make Ladies Night the movie. And since a lot of people tell me that that film is like Mean Girls meets The Strangers, like the short <laughs> film. <laughs> yeah, I would I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I've kind of. <laughs> decided that it'd be really cool to expand it and make an entire feature-length film where the girls invade a frat party. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I'll throw this... I'll, I'll go ahead and throw this out there right now. I really enjoyed Ladies Night when I watched it, and I wouldn't mind being killed by any of the young ladies, so if you need an extra, <laughs> I will come from Don't Raleigh, North me. Carolina. I, Don't you think I'm playing? Now. I will show up from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I will be a victim. And if you need help on effects, I'll help you with that, too. I'd be more than happy to. That'd be awesome. Other than that, I mean, mean, you know, it's not trying to give too much away, but, you know, is, is there a dream project at Concept Films that the three of you would love to do? I mean, what would be the ultimate project for you guys? Stacey, you can take this one. <laughs> what would be a dream project in concept media? Hmm. Oh, that's a, I don't know. There's a lot. I have so many ideas. <laughs> I mean, like, it, it, you know, producer producer comes up to you and goes, okay, here's X money. You know, what would your, what, you know, if it was going to be a remake, what would your guys' dream re- remake be? If you could do any remake, huh? Well, I mean, that's the current trend in Hollywood. I mean, (laughs) right? Pretty much. It's true. It's true. I I would do Phenomena or Suspiria. Wow, Phenomena! You are after my heart. Someone already beat you (laughs) to Suspiria, unfortunately. But Phenomena. I mean, that's you know, and that's one of his. That's one of the films that a lot of people seem to crap on, but I always enjoyed Mm -hmm. Phenomena. Oh wow, that would be a fun. I I love that movie. I know it. It gets such a bad rap, but I I I really enjoy that movie. Oh man! <laughs> How about you, Ryan? I know there's got to be something in you. <laughs> well, I have a dream project and I have a remake. My remake All is right, probably going to be pretty comical, but um, I would remake Carrie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't really uh, care for that new film. <laughs> See, I haven't seen the new so, one yet, so I don't, you know, I can't really give it's a professional so disappointing. opinion. Oh, no. <sighs> well, let me ask you this, because but, you, you guys work on the independent circuit, so mm-hmm. maybe you can lead, uh, lend some, some insight into this. What I like about what Concept Media does and what you guys do is you're bringing fresh, original stories to the genre. Okay. Mm-hmm. You're not rip, you're not ripping off anyone else's work. You're not, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of remakes, but every once in a while right. Hollywood surprises me. But what are your thoughts on Hollywood throwing all of this money into remakes that the majority of the time wind up sucking really bad mm-hmm. when they could have come to people like you and said, "Hey man, here's uh you know, we were going to do a, a shitty remake of this, so instead of us wasting $20 million, you know, here's a, here's half a million dollars. Here's a million dollars. Go make something fresh and original. You know, what what are your guys' thoughts on things like that? I would gladly oh, accept an man. offer like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you should take an offer like that because mm-hmm. honestly, and maybe I'm a snob, but I, I do get kind of sick of the crap that Hollywood tends to pump out. I mean, because... The reason they do remakes and all the stuff, they want a quick, easy money maker that they can just throw into CG on and then throw it out there because people watch it. And 
it's disappointing. I mean, I would love to see someone like Ryan people sell his stories to Hollywood. That would be awesome. Ryan has a different way of looking at things. He th- always thinks outside the box, and I, that's what was so cool about Ladies Night is it's completely different because usually, like he said, we were taking it from like a, a strong woman and taking taking the strong woman and and, and um, well, like you said, he saw it, but um, that's what was so cool about that. And I think it's you know because I think Ryan has always talked about going out to L.A. and I think mm-hmm. it's just a new way of looking at all this stuff, and it's a really cool way just him even talking about any movies like. I remember when you said, when you were so excited to go watch Carrie, and then you came back like, oh my god, like I would have done this or I like this, I didn't like this, and I don't know. You just always have a fresh way of looking at everything. Mhm. Well, I mean, well, let me put it to you this way then: Is Hollywood better off? with these mainstream films that are getting remade, you know, a lot of people bitch about sequels. A lot of people bitch about remakes. You're damned if you do. You're damned if you don't e- either way. But do you feel like they would be better served to just do, keep doing sequels instead of remaking the original classic? Like, well, I'll give you, I'll give you the, perfect, the perfect example of that would be the um, – uh, well, technically, I guess it would be a sequel. That pseudo sequel of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre they just did not that long ago, the 3D one. Yeah, I really liked that movie. You did like that. And I en- I enjoyed that it was kind of brave of them to try to jump back so far in the continuity and try to make a pseudo sequel to the original. I thought that was really mm-hmm. ballsy. And sometimes ideas like that kind of they pop, they work. And then there's other movies that are remade, like When a Stranger Calls. Mm-hmm. I had a big issue with that movie. It was a very crappy remake. It was poorly acted. But also, it was the first, like, what, 15 minutes of the original film stretched out for an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and I, like just, when... I hate... Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, that kind of reminds me of when they remade Psycho all those years ago. But Oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that that cracks me up. That movie has caused some uh, debates between me and Sean. <laughs> because he likes it. He really enjoyed the Gus Van Sant film. I did. Really? And the main, yeah, and I didn't. I really didn't like the fact that we got to see so much of Anne Heche. Right. It. Because, yeah, it's just bad. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> that cracked me up. Now, as, as actresses and, 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 you know, selecting your roles, uh, Christy and Stacey, you know, do you feel, you know, thinking about it from the remake and, and the sequel perspective, um, would you feel that it's harder as an actress to – Try to recreate a uh, a role that someone else has done, kind of kind of like what you did, Christy, with the second film. Or mm-hmm. do you think it would be harder to completely come up with a new character and to portray that character instead? I mean, oh. I really think it's kind of equal on both ends. I mean, mm-hmm. it. Acting doesn't work unless you step into that role and you really take it for your own and that you really put yourself into that role, making it yours. So even if you are portraying, you know, a character that I think, and Christy may agree with me because I have not had this issue, but, um, you know, when you're stepping into a role somebody else has done, you know, the hardest part about that is probably the pressure. You know, you feel like, hey, people know this girl as this actress mm-hmm. and acts this way. And then, you know, you're, you're a completely different person. But I think, you know, I'm a big believer in thinking that that works. You know, I'm not a huge fan of switching out actresses, but sometimes it, it works. And with Christy, mm-hmm. it works very well. Um, but, yeah, yeah, portraying an existing role, you know, taking over somebody else's, I guess, stead and then, you know, or getting a new one, both both of them have their challenges because you just 
you really just need to throw yourself into them, and you need to make them your own, because if you're not, you're just reading lines on paper. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, when I when I had taken over the role for the second midsummer, I guess the best thing that worked in my favor was that it was written that it was three years later. So I could, in a way, kind of take that character um, to where I thought she would be three years later rather than it being a month later. You know what I mean? So sure. I could kind of take Audrey to where she needed to be at that time. Um but going to Ladies' Night and getting cast as Camille, I was the stereotypical, supposed to be the, the bitchy redhead, you know. So I guess that kind of was easy enough for me to do, I guess, in a way. So she was fairly easy to uh, understand, there's not much, I guess. There's not much substance to the girls <laughs> of Ladies' Night. And I don't say that, like, to make them sound like, they're poorly written characters. It's just that these girls, you don't really know what their real lives are like when they are out doing these kills. I wanted, I constructed the movie around the idea of one of those <laughs> jokes, a blonde brunette and a redhead walk into a party. <laughs> so. you know, I mean, I, I find that to be the interesting concept though. You know, what I really liked about ladies night in particular was, you know, yes, we've had, We've had female killers before on the screen. We we can list a million of them off, but I liked the concept of three attractive women, you know, going out and basically basically setting up and slaughtering these pig-headed men, you know, <laughs> throwing a, you know, doing what they're doing and I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about the twist in that that I liked. But you know, they didn't come across as, you know, the dumb bimbos. They didn't come across as, you know, the slutty party girls. I mean, they used elements of those characters to do it, but I didn't get, never got the impression that 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 they were just the stereotypical killer girl in the movie who's just got these issues. They seem like, you know, if you did it as continuous shorts or you did it as a movie, I have a feeling that the characters probably have a very interesting backstory and a history to them. And since you had said oh, that you're you. you're looking at doing the movie, you know, are you planning on expanding on that? Well, that's an interesting idea because I'm first off, I talk to the girls of Ladies Night all the time. Um Christy, Amanda and Emily. We all we'll all get together on the phone sometimes and just talk like a conference call Mm -hmm. and Amanda kind of playfully joked that um, each girl should get their own origin short before Ladies Night the movie comes out to explain a little bit of why they do what they do but that way I didn't have to really mess with it and slow the pace of Ladies Night the movie down Mm -hmm. and so I I thought that was an interesting concept, but that would be an incredible amount of work. Mm-hmm. Sure. While trying to get a feature length film off the ground. Oh, I, I would certainly so. agree. But like I said, mm-hmm. it's uh, what I thought was really nice about that was you never mm-hmm. got the impression that, that the three ladies were just, you know, quote unquote, you know, cut out of cardboard, stereotypical killers. You know, you definitely feel like there's more going on, there's more behind the scenes that you don't know. So, I mean, that's definitely a compliment to your writing and to the actresses that played, you know, in those roles. So, I, you know, I, for one, am definitely looking forward to to a full length of uh, Ladies' Night. Well, thank you. Thank oh, you well, I mean, i got to give credit where credit's due. I mean, like I said, it was <laughs> there was – when I saw the short, I mean, it just – it drew me into more of what concept media does and looking into mm-hmm. the actors and actresses that you work with. So, I mean, it's – you know, like I said, I, I'm definitely looking forward to that and to, to Midsummer as well. But um, well, thank you. we've got about nine minutes left, so what I want to do mm-hmm. is I want to go around to each one of you. You know, um, <laughs> any projects that you have coming up, whether it's concept media or not, you know, just kind of let people know what's going on, how they can get in contact with you, um, if you do any charity work, things like that. And um, if you want, we'll start with Stacy on that. Um, I don't necessarily have any projects 
any definite projects is what I should say. I've got I got a few that I am in discussions over. Um, so hopefully those pan out. <laughs> but I think they will. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, fans yeah, wanna I have, I have a few of those, so if fans want to follow you, I mean, what's best? Twitter, Facebook? Do you have a Do you have a web page? Anything like that? Um, I actually have a Facebook and a website. Um, on Facebook, I think I'm still under. I think you can find me under Stacy Freeders and Stacy Ravel because I've recently yes. changed my last name. Um, so you can find me under that. I do have a Facebook like <laughs> page, and I also have a website. It's Freelance Entertainment. Excuse me, freelanceentertainer dot com, and then they can uh, they can like my Facebook straight from there, or follow me on Twitter from the, the website as well. Okay, Stacy, or Stacy, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Christy. Okay. Um, just right now, I'm looking forward to hopefully the um, Ladies Night the movie, and um, can't wait to be a part of that. Not sure how long. Um, that's going to be, but um, I believe that it'll happen here with soon. I guess um, if anybody wants to follow me, I'm on Facebook just under Christy Faulkner. I'm also on Twitter, um, crazed underscore Christy F, um, and I'm also on Instagram under Christy underscore Faulkner. Now, and when I had you on before, you had mentioned um, you do a lot of charity work and stuff for CF cystic fibrosis. Mm-hmm. Have you done anything right. recently, and do you have any events that you would like to tell your friends uh, coming up about for charity work? <clears throat> I haven't done anything recently, but the uh, Boomer Asias and Trap Shoot is coming up soon, so I will definitely inform everybody about um, doing that. i got to practice up on my gun shooting skills, I guess, because those clay birds Man, those are hard to get sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I actually just bought a shotgun on Sunday, so taking that to the um, – we have some family that have a lot of land, so when it gets warmer, go out and practice out there. But i um, looking forward to seeing Mr. Boomer Sison again and his son, Gunner. Um, and I think that comes up in June. Um, but I would always let anybody know on my social media um, – any cystic fibrosis events that would be happening. So um, if you want to know or come or just donate money, you can donate to your local chapters, um, the cystic fibrosis chapters, um, which you can find online. Or I always say Boomer Sison Foundation is amazing, and we can see the money really going to work. And I think he hit $100 million like um, sometime last year. So it's just oh, wow. amazing. He's awesome. He's just such a great guy. That's a lot. Now, Ryan, that, so. now yeah. Ryan, for you, you know, concept media, anything, you know, what do you have coming up? What can we look forward to? How can people follow you and, and keep in touch with what you guys are doing? Well, I mean, right now you, we pretty much have uh, Sean just working on Don't Fuck in the Woods, and then um, you blush. I'm, yeah, a little. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, in the forest, so. <laughs> and then I'm actively scripting Ladies Night, the movie. I mean that's just kinda what's pulled me in and I'm pretty far into the script. I like where it's going. It seems like it will live up to kind of being a mean girls meets the stranger. Well, I can't wait um, for that. Yeah, I already have, like, pretty much a full cast interested in the film, and I keep them kind of updated. Now, there's no commitments or anything like that because, you know, I don't know when this is happening, but I'd like it to happen sure. soon. And mm-hmm. I do have some wonderful people interested in the film. Kelsey is going to be in it, of course. Kelsey is just an amazing friend to work with in the film industry, but that's what I'm working on. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at – it's at – the real Ryan S and real is spelled R E E L like maybe real. And then you can find me under Ryan Stacy on Facebook. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, before I let you go, it is, um, this is the last show in women in horror month. So I, I, w- I mm-hmm. wanted to throw in a question about women in horror in particular, okay. again, because you guys work on the independent scene. I'm interested to get your, your thoughts on this. Um, mm-hmm. Christy took part in a series that I did and, and I'm still doing, 
called uh, Dead La Beauty, Horror, Scream Queens, mm-hmm. and Rising Talent. And Christy yeah. was great, uh, answered the questions, just gave me all kinds of info. Um, but I've started to notice a lot more recently in the independent scene, a lot of the women who take a lot of roles in the horror industry, and you know, I'm not going to call anyone out because I'm not trying to make anyone mm-hmm. feel bad, but I have noticed more and more that a lot of independent actresses almost seem to be insulted or do not want to have screen queen or you know anything with the horror industry really associated with their names um ladies because you're actresses what are your thoughts on that and ryan working in the industry have have you had that have you guys ever had that problem when it came to casting that uh that you know you didn't have someone who wanted to promote or something because they didn't really they wanted the role but they didn't want the name association with it. You can go first. Girl. Who wants to go first? Huh? Which one? I'll, I'll let Christy go. Christy, you go. I I don't mind the the title. I think it's you know like I said I'm nominated for Scream Queen so if I had an issue for it I wouldn't be blowing on my social media like vote for me vote for me. Um, I think it's it's cool. Um, I don't think it's a it's a bad thing, but I don't know why anybody would. But I mean, that's just my personal opinion. So, sure, Stacy. And uh, what were you gonna say, Ryan? Okay. No, go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> as far as screen queen goes, I would love to be considered a screen queen. That'd be awesome. I mean, I think a lot of people who and I feel like this is kind of a waste, and it's a disappointment. But a lot of people I know try to get into the film industry, and they and they they meet your star in horror movies. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of the times they're afraid of the stigma that's attached with Scream Queen that they're going to become, you know, another Jamie Lee Curtis or Barbara Crampton, you know, and they're just going to be associated with these types of films for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. Well. For me, I mean, I love horror movies. I I have seen so many. I mean, yeah, it'd be great to win an Oscar. I w- I would love to be Jennifer Lawrence. However, <laughs> I love and have always loved and had a passion for horror movies. So I think a lot of it's just pe- just actresses, you know, first coming into the industry, just trying to get their name out there, get some experience in, and they just don't want that title attached to whatever they're playing to their name to whatever they're associated with, just to avoid being typecast. True. true. I would love it. (laughs) Ryan? I've never found, um, working with anybody, that I've never had any girl say that they're offended by that. I mean, I I just find it to be an interesting aspect. I mean, it's... Oh, I know. If I name people act that way. Trust me, if, if I name some of the names that turn me down... You know, and and trust me, they are names that that you guys would know, and, and you know, I mean, even bigger names, you know, that star in several horror films, but just absolutely do not want the title attached to them. I, I just find that amazing. But you know, the definition of screen queen has, you know, just like everything else in the industry, has evolved. It's no longer screen oh, yeah. queen is no longer just an actress who can play the lead or in a supporting role in Screams, there's so much more that goes into it now. I mean, Scream Queen can encompass, you know, actresses, writers, directors, you know, anything that pertains to the genre. And I'm glad to see mm-hmm. that there is, you know, especially with Stacy and with Christy, you know, there is young talent and you're working with that talent, you know, who are driving towards that end. And again, that's one of the things I really enjoy about concept media and the things that you guys do. And I, you know, I hope you guys keep it up. Well, thanks, but I man. just wanted to. Thank you. Oh, of course. You know, you guys are always welcome on the show. You guys know that. If you ever have any news you need put up, uh, just send it along to me, and you know, we at Horror Society will take care of you guys. Well, thank you very much. Awesome. You guys always do. Thank mean, you. We appreciate everything that Horror Society does for us, for real. <laughs> well, and we appreciate so. the fact that you guys take the time to talk to us. So. I wish mm-hmm. you luck on the premiere coming up. I wish I could make it out to Ohio March 1st, but I can't do it. But uh, like I said, if you need someone to kill or you need help with effects for a lady night, <laughs> Ohio's not that far away, so I can make it out there. <laughs> well, I will definitely keep you posted, sir. 
Yes. I appreciate Definitely. it. Well, you guys, you guys no have problem. a good night. Um, I will send you the archive the uh, version to you guys uh, in the next day or so. Thank Sounds you good, so man. much. Awesome. All right, thank guys. You. Thank you. It was you. a pleasure. Bye. Always. Bye. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, we just had uh, a group of people on from Concept Media. We just had Ryan Stacy. We just had uh, Stacy Frieders and Christy Faulkner on to talk about the upcoming Midsummer Nightmares 2, uh, the potential for a feature-length edition of Ladies' Night. And if you have not checked out the current rendition of Ladies' Night, you need to check it out. Uh, I think you'll find what I'm saying about about how the characters are portrayed and how it's done to actually be very interesting and kind of a fresh take on the female killer in cinema. Coming up, we are going to have our Blu-ray review of Scream Factories Beneath. And let me tell you, I was pleasantly surprised with how this movie turned out. It had the potential, it has the look and the potential to be a crappy movie, but once again, I think Scream Factory has found some independent gold on the market. But, coming up next, we are going to have our second song in our Metal Blade Spotlight for the evening. Once again, the name of the band is Flotsam and Jetsam. The CD is No Place for Disgrace, a remaster released this year. And the name of the song is Hard On You.
Spotlight. That was Flotsam and Jetsam off of the album No Place for Disgrace 2014. The name of the song was Hard on You. To give you a little bit of background information, Flotsam and Jetsam's No Place for Disgrace 2014 will be released March 4th, 2014. Legendary classic thrash speed metal act Flotsam and Jetsam have announced their new album, No Place for Disgrace 2014. Uh, will uh, was released February 14th in Europe. Uh, the 17th in the UK and is going to be released in North America here shortly. Fans can listen to PAAB, watch videos, and pre-order No Place for Disgrace at metalblade.com backslash Flotsam and Jetsam. Flotsam and Jetsam comments, we have recorded No Place for Disgrace, or we have re-recorded No Place for Disgrace because we have a lot of requests to remix this record. The master tapes have been very difficult to obtain, so we decided to re-record the album and, and use some of today's technologies to recreate it. The aim was not really to change, but to enhance it with the opportunity, with the use of new tools. We have the time available as well, and it just seemed like a no-brainer. A lot of the diehard fans are really nervous about it, but I think that the final result, they will embrace it. The sound quality is 100% better and more refined. And personally, I have to agree. Again, those of you that know me, Flotsam and Jetsam is not in my usual realm of what I listen to when it comes to metal. But again, uh, a powerful album, a very well-done re-recording. I do remember the original album, and I do think the remaster, the re-recording does sound very good. Um, if you're a fan of Flotsam and Jetsam and this style of metal, I definitely recommend you head over to metalblade.com backslash, backslash Flotsam and Jetsam to pick it up. Or you can pick it up at iTunes or your local uh, music retailer. Flotsam and Jetsam will be heading over to Europe in February to support Sepultura and Legion of the Damned. The tour began on February 7th. Um, and they again, they are uh, touring with Sepultura and Legion of the Damned. Kind of wish that tour was coming to the U.S. because I would love to see Sepultura, Legion of the Damned, and Flotsam and Jetsam all on the same stage so definitely make sure to pick that up and we want to say thank you to our friend uh, Kelly out there at Metal Blade for sending that along to us to listen to so thank you for that to round out our evening we are now going to do our Blu-ray review of Screen Factories Beneath and you know I have to I have to admit to you when I first got it I saw it was another chiller TV film and you know the first one that I reviewed from them Dead Souls wound up being a good film so I wasn't quite as hesitant when I saw what it was you know a lot of people have been looking for that next you know monster in the lake type of film you know jaws you know lake Lake Placid, whatever you want, you know, whatever your creature feature likes are, and and I think this one brings something a little unique to the storyline. To give you an idea of what we're looking at here is uh, when a group of young friends accompanies, or excuse me, when a group of young friends commemorating their high school graduation take a trip to the remote Black Lake, their celebration turns into a nightmare. Trapped in a leaking boat with no oars. 
The teens faced the ultimate test of friendship and sacrifice during a terror-stricken fight for survival when they find something is living beneath the surface. Daniel Zovada, Bonnie Dennison, Chris Conroy, and Mark Margolis star in this highly suspenseful and bloody thriller. And uh, spoiler alert for those of you that have not seen the film, uh, this is not a piranha. It is a rather interesting looking fish, and it is a large fish. Um, I have to admit, you know, it, it, when you when you first look at it, you're kind of wondering, oh, you know, typical kids arguing trapped by a monster on a boat. But one of the things that I think they, they did really well with this film was, was work on the emotional strings attached to all of the characters. Um, you know, there's a lot of backstabbing. You know, it looks like there was a possible love triangle. Um, you know, some things aren't spelled out 100%, you know, when it comes to that. But, uh, you know... For for a movie to take place in a contained location like it was, um, they find a way to really ratchet up the emotion and, and the suspense. Uh, there is a fair share of blood in this film, and uh, you know the fish. The fish in and of itself is actually an amazing uh, an amazing accomplishment. It is not CGI. As a matter of fact, when you watch the special features and the behind the scenes. And for this film, I, I highly recommend it because there's a lot there for you to look at. Um, one of the behind-the-scenes runs uh, right around 50 minutes, and it's uh, a look behind beneath, making the fish movie. And what I really think that this does, if you're an aspiring filmmaker or you know you think it's easy to film a movie like this, the behind-the-scenes really showed you you know, what it was like on set. Like, it's not easy filming in the water. They showed putting, you know, the platforms out there that, that they stood on, you know, having the crane that the camera is attached to hovering right above the water. You know, it showed where it rained on set. Uh, things that people didn't take into account, like getting a bad sunburn during shooting. You know, just all these little nuances that you don't think about when a film is being made or, you know, you sit there, oh, I could have done better than that. You know, there are things that you just don't take into account when you're filming, and I really feel the behind-the-scenes shows that. It also shows uh, the camaraderie of the actors on the set. We got to uh, see uh, bits and pieces of of their auditions and how they interacted with one another, Uh, interactions with uh, director Larry uh, Fessenden and how he was on the set. So, I mean, you know, the locations were great. It, it, the movie had a, an air of creepiness to it, um, some suspense that, you know, to a degree you felt about the characters, but then, you know, some of them you were glad to see die just like in any other film. Um, one of the nice little elements that I like is the character of Zeke is basically filming the whole thing, and on the behind the scenes, uh, they actually have from the web what the Zeke, which is a series that the character did where he goes into the girls' locker room or he talks about his you know making his movie with zombies and ninjas and robots and dinosaurs and things like that so I found that to be to be a nice uh side piece as well and then uh you had what's in black, which you know is is starring the director. Um, and he kind of talks about the conspiracy theory and, and things that are going on inside of Black Lake. So I found that to be really good. Uh, Fessenden also has his take on the Jaws films. And uh, I, th- I found that to be pretty informative a- as well. It, uh, his views on the series and, and the film in particular is interesting. The theatrical trailer is well known. Of course, it's a chiller TV uh, theatrical trailer. And I think it does really well. Uh, it's got a running time of 90 minutes. Um, it is it is an unrated film, not rated. Um, you know, you also have uh, audio commentary by uh, Larry Fessenden and uh, Graham Resnick. You know, so overall, as, as far as a creature feature, you know, I think the circumstances are are believable. Again, some of the some of the death sequences, you know, bring out some blood. One of the young ladies is bitten in the arm and it punctures a uh an artery in her arm and she she bleeds out and well i think one of the scenes in the film that that kind of draws a lot of emotion and uh um i don't know what the word i want is for this um 
I don't know if you if, if fear is the word, but when the characters find out that the fish is attracted to blood and they dump the uh, the, the girl that gets bit winds up dying from bleeding out, and in order to make their escape, they decide to throw her body in the lake and try to paddle for shore and. It was kind of interesting to to watch the reactions of the characters when they threw the body in the water because that was their friend and kind of watching how, you know, if you've ever been fishing and you throw a line out there, you know how a fish will strike a line and it'll bob, you know, the bobber will bob and then it'll stop for a second and then it'll hit it again and bob and then it'll go under. It was really interesting watching the characters' reactions to that scene in the film, especially once the fish takes their friend under the water. You know, and it's, and it, like I said, it really goes into the emotional content of, you know, who's your friend and who's not. You know, later on in the film when they're voting who to throw off of the boat to create a distraction so that the rest of the rest of them can get away is, is pretty gripping. Especially when dirty little secrets about one another start coming out towards the end and, you know, the surprise ending where, uh, the fish gets his just desserts, shall we speak. But uh, overall, again, as a creature feature in a film that takes place on the water, um, is it Jaws? No. Is it Corman's Piranha? No. But this movie actually has a, a, a lot of potential, and I think it'll do pretty well on the uh, direct-to-video market. Again, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that uh, Scream Factory has done a good job. I like their affiliation with Chiller TV to get some of this good independent horror out into the hands of the fans. So I recommend going out and picking this movie up. Um, I think it's 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 a good popcorn movie. It's a good sit down with your buddies and drink movie. Um, movie has a little bit of everything for everyone. There's no gratuitous nudity or anything like that but you know the actresses are, are nice to look at you know that all the actors and actresses hit their marks i think the camera work is well done i think the effects work is amazing and again extremely extremely impressed with uh with the giant fish and how they made it move around and make it look like it was doing things in the film so the fish is truly a believable character in the film so Go over to uh, Scream Fact or ShoutFactory.com and order it on there, or head to your local retailer, Amazon.com, wherever you get your movies. Check Redbox. Um, I can't guarantee that the film is in there, but if it is, it is definitely worth your dollar fifty rental to check this out. Well, I think it's been a pretty good evening. Uh, we had lots of interesting guests on. To start the show off, we did our DVD review of a Frankenstein Created Woman first time it has been released on HD uh, through exclusive media and Millennium Entertainment. I want to say thank you to Heather Wixon for sending that out to us for review. We have another film from them going into the review queue this week. We also want to say thank you to our, our friends at Screen Factory, Tom Chen, for sending along Larry Fessenden's Beneath on Blu-ray. Again, another independent creature feature um, that I think people should be checking out. So thank you to Tom for sending that along. I want to say thank you to my friend Kelsey out at Metal Blade Records for sending along Flotsam and Jetsam's most recent album for review, No Place for Disgrace. You can look for the DVD reviews and the review of the CD coming up soon on com. Um, unfortunately, we could not get our guest, our one guest on this evening to talk about rock band versus vampires, but, um, you know, we are going to reschedule that uh, as soon as we can to have them on another show, but, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was nice to see the trailer and check out the film. So I would I would love to have uh have them come on and discuss the film in more detail coming up soon. So Danny Thompson, I'm sorry we couldn't get you on this evening, but we should be able to get you guys on soon to talk about the project in more detail. 
from Concept Media, we also had Ryan Stacy, Christy Faulkner, and Stacy Frieders on to talk about Midsummer Nightmare 2 and all of the projects going on with them. So we want to send a hearty thank you to them for coming on to the show and talking about their latest project. So next week is going to be an interesting show. I don't want to give anything away yet, but we, of course, will have some interesting guests. We will do some more interesting DVD reviews, and, of course, we will have more bands for our Metal Blade Spotlight. And speaking of which, to close out our show for the evening, uh, the highlight band for next week's show is Mount Salem. The name of the CD is Endless, and the song track is The Tower. So, ladies and gentlemen, until next week, this is the Dead Man saying thank you, and rest in peace.